About ten years ago, uh, there was a great documentary made called Lian Yan, and it was made by a guy called Bill Johnson. And Bill Johnson was English, and he came from Liverpool, where he'd been in a seminary with uh, Pete Postlethwaite, who later became a great English actor. Bill Johnson, they'd both left the seminary without becoming priests, and Bill Johnson came to West Australia, married, and adopted an Aboriginal kid called Lewis and John Johnson. And one night, Lewis and John Johnson was walking home, and a car stopped. He was assaulted, and then driven over, and left for dead. And Bill Johnson, uh, and, and he, he got home, but he died of the injuries. And um, so Bill Johnson rang Pete Postlethwaite and got him to come to Australia. And he teamed him with Archie Roach. And Archie took Pete Postlethwaite on a sort of guided tour of Australia. And the first place they went was the very place where Lewis and John Johnson was assaulted and murdered. And then that was when Pete Postlethwaite learnt that the two young white guys that had killed him were not Australian, they were English. And they'd only been in the country three weeks. One of their mates had got assaulted by an Aboriginal youth and they'd gone out to get a black. So after this, going around Australia, um, going into the desert, spending time with tribal people in the desert, uh, spending quite a bit of time with Patrick Dodson, and being informed about th this great dramatic subplot in Australian history that never goes away. At the conclusion of the documentary, what Pete Postlethwaite said, and I think it's the most interesting thing I've ever heard an English person say about Australia, he said, terra nullius, the idea that this was the land of nobody, that it wasn't just a legal doctrine, that it actually amounts to our creation myth, or one of our primal creation myths. And with, because of that, forgetting is so much easier. And because of that, we don't have to think about issues to do with remote Aboriginal communities. And I think we all, to some extent, non-Aboriginal Australians, not, I don't just mean white Australians, I mean non-Aboriginal Australians with all the races and colours that that now includes, I think we still live in that state. And someone like Shane, who has been engaged with Aboriginal Australia for, for most of his life, um, I thought I'd like to ask you, mate, when, when was the moment when it came home to you that there was this other reality in this country that, that, that you could not ignore? Um, well, growing up, Marty, in southwest Victoria, uh Aboriginal people were a fact of life. I mean, we had a mission, the old Framlingham mission was to the northeast, and the Lake Condor mission was to the northwest of us, not far away. A reasonable sized Aboriginal community surrounded us. And so I was at school with not a lot, but I would, sporting days, I would keep coming across Aboriginal people who I got to know and uh, some of whom were my friends and who I really liked. Um, one fellow in particular who was a great mate. And, um, and I remember being on the street as a little kid, what you remember, you know, um, with my mother, only three or four years old, and her talking to Aboriginal women. And it wasn't until years and years and years later I said to my mum, who were those women? And it was Uncle Banjo Clark's mother and another woman, Nani Jessie Taylor. And, who was a friend of my mum's mother, and I realised I was just part of a continuum, really. But I was about 16 or 17, and a mate, mate of mine who played music, we were walking down the street in Warrnambool one Saturday afternoon. The shops closed down in those days. Um, the streets were pretty deserted, and we saw these Aboriginal kids used to gather over in this little, one little area and hang out there. And uh, we knew to leave them alone, a uh, pretty wild mob. And uh, all of a sudden, one of the young Aboriginal bugs came across the road 
and uh, he had a large bottle of beer in his hand, but it was empty. And as he got towards us, and I could tell he was coming kind of menacingly, um, we'll mind our own business. He smashed it on the curbing as he got to us and he came straight at me and held it up to my throat and he said, I should slit your effing throat. And um, funny what you do in those moments. And I just looked him in the eye and said, why would you want to do that? And he didn't. And he threw the bottle down on the ground and walked away. But Aboriginal Australia came crashing into my life at that point. And uh, everything attendant to that, why? Why is this guy so angry? You know, it's not just grog. Why? And um, I probably spent the rest of my life trying to unravel that. I've got to say, <laughs> just to qualify that, Marty, that most of my life in Aboriginal Australia has been... That, that is the most violent experience I ever had yep. in Aboriginal Australia. Yeah. Um, so you... What about you? Um, what yeah. led you into... Uh, what led you into engaging, because this is an interesting area, uh, you have championed through your writing and through the age and your books, um, you've, you've championed the Aboriginal story, you've, uh, where you've found it and the things that have inspired you. Yeah. Why? Well, I think, um, I think Shane and I are both Irish Australia, but Irish Australians, but we have very interesting similarities and very interesting differences. And one of the major differences is that I'm Tasmanian and he's Victorian. And um, Tasmania is a totally different psychology to Victoria. And it's a totally different history. And as you fly over Bass Strait, that used to have the great seal colonies. They're not there anymore. And the, the symbol of the state is the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, not there anymore. And there used to be whales in, in the Derwent River, not there anymore. And you grow up with the face of this old Aboriginal woman, Draganini. And her story, I mean, I could talk for three hours about Draganini, but her story is Shakespearean. It's, it's, it's a hugely dramatic story with, with so many levels and so many aspects to it. And you grow up with that. And it's a haunting image. There's this one particular haunting face and when I first came to Melbourne, which was in 1985, I remember periodically you'd meet smart asses who'd say, um, you know, you're from Tassie, oh, you killed all the blackfellas down there, didn't you? And um, it took me a while to realise that whatever had happened in Tasmania, I knew one story. I knew one story, one Aboriginal story, and I knew it well. And it was years, I was in Melbourne for years before I met anyone who could tell me the story of one Aboriginal person from Melbourne. And it wasn't really till I met Shane and Neil Murray and started to hear the stories of the land in Gippsland and Western Victoria that I began to see that Tasmania and Victoria were actually a lot more closely connected than I thought. But we were taught at school that there were no Aboriginal people in Tasmania. And, you know, as it turns out, my son-in-law has Tasmanian Aboriginal heritage and my grandson has Tasmanian Aboriginal heritage. But at school we were taught that there were no Aboriginal people in Tasmania. And, and I mean, that, the drama of that is just enormous. And it goes into Darwinian theory. It goes into all manner of 19th century dramas. And manners. And manners. And, 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 it's, and then the, the, the incident happens, which is like Shane's incident. I was playing footy and a few of us are half drunk up the back of West Hobart one night and we had a bloke in our team called Boom. Don't even know why he was called that but that's what he was called. And he was up the other end of the street and I'm yelling out to him, hey Boom, hey come on hurry up. And all of a sudden out of this house shot 20 dark skinned, highly upset young men and they attacked us. And I remember this bloke's coming at me swinging punches and I'm thinking, Jesus he looks like Lionel Rose, this bloke. <laughs> and uh, it was at that point 
that I realised that what we had been taught in school was not the whole truth. And that's when the great sort of, the great journey and the great desire to understand, because for me growing up in Tasmania, I was of Irish convict descent. The families had hidden the convict to escape the shame, but in so doing they lost their bridge to their culture. Those convicts probably spoke the Irish language. They lost their songs, their dances, their stories. So there was one great silence. Then on top of it, there was this second great silence, which is what had happened to the people who lived here before my people came, the Aboriginal people. And in my case, I had a third silence because I had a father who'd been to war and survived the war crime and, and didn't speak about it. So I had these three silences and to a large extent, my writing life has been about bridging that silence or finding a credible position from which to stand within it and have a voice. But as far as your work's concerned, Shane, you've got this great iconic song, uh, Solid Rock. What, what drew you to Uluru and what was it about Uluru that made you write that song? I've ruminated long and hard on that. Um, there's an aspect of what makes you not turn away because I think a lot of people do have stories with Aboriginal Australia and it would be very easy to go, that's too hard and to turn away. Um, I guess Uluru was a, a real turning point for me. I, I read a lot, I, I, there wasn't a lot available in those days, say through the 70s or early, you know, early 80s, 70s, say growing up. We were taught nothing really. Um, you know, you might see old man David Blanassi, we didn't know who he was back then, uh, on Rolf Harris's walkabout show playing didgeridoo or um, the postage stamps or there was the noble savage, this image of, what, you know, Aboriginal people standing on one foot holding a spear. There was romantic images, there was, but all I saw around me was um, a really broken thing. And uh, I guess I went looking to see if, was culture still there? Was language still there? Was cultural practice and dance and art, did it still exist? And I went to Uluru, I guess, to look for that. And by a bizarre, by strange... How, how old were you then? Oh, I'm in my 20s, yeah. Early 20s? Early 20s, yeah. Um, I'd been hitchhiking before that when I was 19 up the east coast of Australia. Met lots of Aboriginal people, slept under the Harbour Bridge with all the parkies and there was one old Aboriginal man who was stolen generation, had never found his family and uh, he was an old gentleman um, playing guitar in the park with a couple of Murray fellas in King George Square in Brisbane. I was as down on my luck as they were but I could, I could get the grog from the bottle shop because they weren't allowed in. <laughs> Lots of little stories like that that were beautiful and beautiful encounters, but I went looking for something deeper. And um, by quirk of coincidence, the people from Armada, who had very strong connections uh, to Uluru, had in their recovery, they were in their reco beginnings of their recovery, and they were going back to Uluru to establish a a little artefact tent where they could sell artefacts and make a few bob. And, but really what was going on is, it was an embassy really. They were really there to get the country back. And I just happened to intersect with that moment in history. Met a couple of amazing people, Peter Yates who went on to um, be instrumental in the whole Western Central Desert art movement. Um, and uh, Pat Durango, who still works for the Central Land Council, um, non-Indigenous people, and some amazing Indigenous people. Uh, in Ma, I experienced, I suppose, an In Ma dance there that was uh, compellingly beautiful, spiritual, aesthetically beautiful, uh, haunting, it began in the firelight as the full moon rose over the back of Uluru. 
it was a transformative moment for me, like very deep transformative moment where I, I realised um, there's a really deep intelligence at work here. Yeah, this is not a primitive people. This is a highly civilised cultural reality. Um, and from then I was called to... called powerfully to look deeper into that world and I've spent my life doing that and it's a bottomless well as any cultural reality is. Um, and it's a myth to think that I read this, I forget the writer, but uh, writing about justice and that it's a bit of a, a modern myth to think that ancient societies were primitive and that their forms of justice were um, brutal. And he maintains, in fact, that the opposite is true. You know, um, someone in a traditional Aboriginal reality would no more cut the hand off an offender than we would cut the hand off our sister for doing something wrong. And yet these practices still happen today in the world and happened in the Spanish conquest of South America. So who is really primitive here? It, I wasn't sure that the God of my ancestors had any sway out there in the desert. Lots of big questions came up and um, lots of even uh, moral questions were challenged, I guess. Like in a traditional reality, take with the Western world away from Australia, in a traditional reality, if an Aboriginal woman has twins, in a hard season, all three aren't going to make it. And she has to make a choice. You know, that's not a moral issue, that's actually a pragmatic issue about survival. Um, and that's challenging. And in that song, like I've heard, I've, I've, I've heard Aboriginal people say how shocked they were when they heard Solid Rock, that because for the first time here on commercial radio <laughs> is this song which is expressing an Aboriginal reality and an Aboriginal perspective. And, 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 and one of the climaxes of the song is when you talk about Terra Nullius and then comes the line, someone lied. Um, that's a big line. Um, at that moment, you're committing yourself to a political position. Did you realise at the time that that was what you were doing? Did... Look, it was the next song I wrote. I... We were nobodies at the time that I wrote that song. So uh, I didn't have any sense of any great outcome for that song. Um, and I, I know I, I did wrestle with that line. I, I edited myself. I wanted to say Captain Cook lied, and I do now. Um, but at the time, I just said someone lied. Um, and it, it's really true, like you were talking before, Marty, about the foundation. We, we are such a mess, really. We've got so much work to do, so much catching up to do, to even get to our ground zero point as a nation. We haven't got there yet. Um, we have no meaningful treaty with our First Nations people. There was never a war declared here. There was no suing for peace. No treaty was ever signed. Nothing has changed in this country from a legal perspective for Aboriginal people. They are still the lords of their land. And there are no real instruments to prove that we have any legal right to be here, other than back in England. The whole notion, I don't know why Captain Cook, Lieutenant Cook he was at the time when he came here, I don't know why he took possession of Australia, of the east coast of New South Wales, as it was called then, took possession of that on behalf of the Crown. He was given specific instructions by the Admiralty to negotiate just and fair outcomes with Native people. So it's still a mystery to me why he failed to do that or why he couldn't manage any level of engagement 
uh, meaningful engagement um, and chose in the end to go to a deserted island to raise the British flag, um, which was the last point right at the tip of Cape York before he sailed away back to, to England. Unless, and he's only a lieutenant, he can't make those empire-changing decisions on his own. He must have had a secret letter, burn after reading. It's the only conclusion I can come to as to why Terra Nullius was ever established here. <laughs>